And we're on. Welcome back to the Rally Report. The show's top and only credible analyst, the great Stuart Crawford, is joining us today. And we'll continue to do so unless he decides he no longer likes me. So fingers crossed I don't screw this up or in the future as well. But guys, we're going to talk about Stuart Crawford's picks on who he thinks is going to end the 2023 season as the top dogs. For both men and the woman, we are covering the top 10 for both. Now, before we start, I did title it Power Rankings because it's better clickbait and title. And also, I decided Power Rankings definition can be interchangeable depending on how I see fit. On a real note, we've decided it'd be better to do this rather than Power Rankings going into the season because that's pretty simple. And there's not a lot of guessing and assuming going on. And this show is all about guessing. But anyway. Enough about me. What's going on with you, Stuart? It's been a minute since we've done our last episode, but glad to see you again. Yeah, thanks for having me back. I, uh, I was worried you were getting too big time. You've had some <laughs> top 10 guests. You've, you've been uh, on other podcasts. I, I thought I might have been forgotten about, but I appreciate it. <laughs> no, my definitely, no matter who I get, t- top guests has got to always be Stuart. Um, so honestly, I have not seen Stuart's list but did get a glimpse of his top 10 an hour ago. So I'm just letting you guys all know because I'm just as blind as you are to who he picked. But I'm pumped to get the ball rolling and I'm pumped to see the list that Stuart's created and have this discussion. Um, before we start, Stuart, I wanted to ask, do you think a couple players or people might be offended by the list you've created? I mean, isn't that an intention? That is the intention. Um, yeah, I've listened to your episodes over the summer and you've had some great guests, but I'm disappointed that they all consistently refuse to answer most overrated rate. Oh, my goodness. Goals. Yep, and they continue um, to do so. And they all talk about how great it is for the game to have people being honest, and then it comes down to the crunch <laughs> and they're not willing to put their money where their mouth is. Um, so, yeah. I have, I have no idea if anyone's going to be offended. I Probably couldn't care less in most instances, but <laughs> let's find out. Which is why we have you on. And one more question is, I want to ask, how did you have a hard time putting this list together? And if so, which did you find harder, the men's or the women's? There was a couple of sections I struggled with. So the men's, the bottom couple of spots, 9 and 10, I thought, was a number of players in contention that could creep in that top 10. Um, I felt like the top eight was pretty set for me and you could probably argue about order here and there, but I feel like the top eight is probably not going to change that much. I have got one guy who's not currently in the top eight that I think we'll get up into there that we'll talk about. On the women's side, it was a little bit different. I felt like I had a pretty solid top six and then I felt like there was four spots and maybe eight or nine players that could all be up in contention for them. So again, pr- pretty open. Mm-hmm. So should we should we start with the men's? Wherever you want. All right, let's do it. Um, so why don't we start with? We'll go in reverse order. We'll start with ten. Who do you have as the tenth pick to end the twenty twenty three season? Currently ranked ten is Ferris Suzuki. So I've gone with Mazin, who I think is actually at nine at the moment. So um, he's going to drop down one spot, in my opinion. Um, I, had a, I think that's, that nine and ten spot, like I said, is going to be pretty well contended. Um, you're about to demonstrate that my nine is probably not going to come true um, for reasons that you'll explain that I wasn't aware of until three or four minutes ago. Um <laughs> But yeah, there's a bunch of guys that I'm quite interested to see. Nicky Muller in particular is at his highest ranking and um, just won the European Championships, beating um, Victor Kroon pretty convincingly in the final. Yeah, that was so, impressive. Um, yeah, I kind of felt like Nicky had, well, he definitely had a great season last year. I thought that maybe he was reaching the limits. I didn't think he would go much higher, but um, I wouldn't actually be surprised now if he continues to move up and maybe he can challenge for placing the top 10. Um, How did you feel about Mason's uh, last season? Yeah, he's improved his, uh, there's always been questions over his fitness and his consistency. And I think he's definitely shown signs of improvement on the consistency front. Um, 
and actually look through his results. And uh, the only loss he had last year to a player outside the top eight was to Gregoire Marsh in Black Ball. Um, so that's a positive sign. Uh, I still think that there's questions over whether he can get through uh, get through a full season without any injury problems or being able to back up when you usually get periods during the season where there's like three or four tournaments back to back. And I think, especially for him, if he's starting to make sort of quarterfinals and play maybe one or two extra matches each tournament, that's going to add up. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how his body holds up to that. But yeah, he's definitely improved on the consistency. His game's a lot more solid. So I think he's well suited to hold his spot. It's going to be really tough. I mean, it's interesting. Nine in the world, you imagine that his goal is to break the top eight. But Wait, he actually is ranked eight in the world. Oh, he is? In the current rankings, yeah. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. The, the reason yeah. I've bumped him down is because uh, I'm, I've put Faraz Dasuki up in the top eight. So, I, I would agree with that decision. Um, yeah. And I came across this same problem on the women's side where you've got players that are improving that may actually not move up the rankings, even though their mm -hmm. level of squash might be going up. So a good example uh, I feel like Amanda Sobey could actually end up having her best season. And because of players like Altaya coming back, Gina Kennedy moving up, yeah. Amanda could potentially drop down one or two spots while playing even better squash than she did last year. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I think it's So one more question for Mason. Do you think he has the potential um, to crack into the top five ever in your opinion or no mm, probably not just because he occasionally gives the top guys some trouble but he's not a consistent threat to to those guys mm. like i say he's he's much better now at beating the guys ranked below him but um i don't remember too many times this season where he beat guys ranked above him and can probably go through his results but um, yeah no i think that's a fair point I, I I agree with you on that pick. Not Sorry. not the very top, but even guys like like Diego or Shibagi or Momin, like I don't remember him getting wins over those guys. So yeah, they dispatch him pretty pretty easily. For me, yeah. look at the results. Um, but yeah, let's. Well, why don't we move on to Short's ninth pick? Currently ranked nine in the world is Marwan El Shibagi. Well, I should probably talk about Marwan first because I have not included Marwan in my top 10, which might be controversial. That is controversial. Um, I'm talking about upsetting people. I, I suspect he might be offended. Not that, fortunately, he's got the same attitude to me as me, which is I don't really care what other people think of me. So I'm sure he's not that offended by me. Um, yeah, that, he, he does give off that mm, personality. He really doesn't right, care. Which um, is one of my favorite things about Marwan. Um, but yeah, I... I had him and Mazin as the two main contenders for that number 10 spot, but I, I went for Mazin. Uh, number nine, I went for Yusuf Ibrahim. Um, I was quite excited to see how he gets on this year. It's sort of his first season playing full-time after graduating from college. Uh, I think he showed signs last year that he can play at a very, very high level. I mean, making the Windy City Open final is no joke. And being too love up and Paul Call in the final as well, but yeah, you just let me into a little bit of information that I was unaware of. So, yeah. So for for those who don't know, uh, Yusuf Ibrahim sustained a knee injury that has been bugging him for the past two years, and he's decided to treat it properly by taking the first half of the season off. Um, I did tell that to Stuart before we started the recording, but he is going to continue with his stick with his pick as Yusuf because he is coming back January, and the season does not end in January. So clearly there could be movement up. I don't really see him jump plummeting down the rankings anyway. So no, but he will have a lot of points to defend when, when you say he comes around. Um, mm. And if he's missing tournaments in the first half of the season, it's going to be hard for him to make up the points that when those points come off, he probably will take a bit of a hit at that point. So yeah, now that I know that I'd actually be surprised that if he was in the top 10, but, I felt like I went with him, um, so I'll stick stick to it. What what would you what would you say are your biggest concerns with Yusuf's game? Um, 
I mean, anyone that gets an injury at a young age is a concern. I mean, if you look at guys that have hung around and been pretty consistent, they've all looked after the body really well. Like, I can't remember Shibagi mm. having any major injuries. Um, Gote basically went his entire career without any significant in- injuries until the sort of last two, three years. But certainly in his younger years, he was very good with his body. Uh, Nick Matthew was an exception. I think he had a pretty bad shoulder injury when he was around 23, 24 from memory. Um, and he obviously recovered and went on and had an amazing career. But um, yeah, anyone that's getting injuries around sort of early 20s is never a good sign. I mean, you, see, you start with Rami, who had ongoing yeah. injury problems throughout his career. Mm-hmm. I think going all the way back to when he was like 14 or 15, he had uh, knee problems and missed like a year and a half of squash back at a young age. And then it just plagued him all the way through. So, that yeah, that would be my biggest concern for someone like Yusuf is that if he's getting injuries now, and not just minor niggles where he's out for two or three weeks, but he's potentially looking at surgery as an option. Hopefully not, but that's never a good sign. So I've seen I've seen a numerous times where the commentators have mentioned about the way he moves, especially in the front two corners, as a dangerous way to move. Do you do you agree with those statements that the commentators are making? Yeah, he's very dynamic into the corner. He doesn't really lunge that. that I don't want to say he doesn't lunge well. He just he doesn't lunge. He's, he's so explosive and quick that he almost gets up to the ball fast enough that he doesn't have to take that sort of desperation lunge where it's it's the only way you can get the ball back. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would say that that has a tendency, if you can lunge well, it sort of reduces the load a little bit um, because you then, the way Yusuf moves into the corner, he then has to use more explosiveness to get back out of that position as well. So, um, And you can see in his legs, he's obviously a strong guy, so he can handle it. Um, yeah. But, but it's tough. And why don't we move on to the eighth eighth pick for Stuart? Currently eighth is Mason Hisham. Who have you got for eight? So dropping down a couple of spots, I've actually got Tarek dropping to eight. Um, and not because I think his level is going to drop drastically. I certainly expect him to remain consistent and reach quarterfinals at most of the events that he plays in. I just I struggle to see how he's going to go beyond that and maybe challenge the top four. Um, I think when we, we get to talking about the top four, there's, there's certainly three players that I think most people would agree are playing at a slightly higher level than the rest. Um, and one of the issues when you're in that ranking bracket is that it's really hard to to break into that next level because you've constantly got to beat them. Like for, for Tarek to win any event at the moment, if it goes to seeding, he would have to beat three of the top four players in the world. Um, yeah, I don't off- really see him doing that back-to-back. Yeah, exactly. Um, and you saw that, I mean, he he gave, um, was, uh, was Paul, he gave a, a great match at the Worlds, lost in five, and then Paul struggled the next day against Shibagi, I think. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's really hard. And Joe Makins had a similar issue with being ranked outside the top eight at nine. Mm-hmm. Um, and he has he has to play in one of those top seeds early every single tournament just to get into the quarterfinals. The difference between being seeded eight and nine is so significant because if you're seeded eight, you can't play any of those top players. You can't play anyone ranked above you until the quarterfinals at the earliest. And if you're seeded nine, you have to play someone in the top eight to get into the quarterfinals. So... <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a tough one I, with the with the way the draw is designed. Do you how many more good years do we think we have left of Moman? He's currently age thirty four. Yeah, this latter half of his career. But again, going back to what I said about looking after your body, he's someone that has done a good job of that. Um, and some of it's luck, and some of it's probably genetics. And um, but he's he's always seemed to be in good shape physically. He, doesn't really have uh, too many bad periods where he's struggling with his body. So I don't see any reason why he can't stay at a high level for another two, three years. But again, it's, it's going to be so tough for him to to maintain that ranking. I actually looked, he was, he's been in the top 
four in the world for about the last four years. Um, yeah, I think back in the day, I made a bold statement saying I don't think men would ever crack into that top top five, top four, and then uh, I've done it. And then went ahead and won the world you're championships. <laughs> Uh, and what, what was your thinking on that one? Like, was for, there a reason for Mo? Why? Well, at the time, where during the game where it was dominated by Ramy, Nick Matthew, Greg Gaultier, um, he just didn't seem up to par in, in terms of level. On top of the fact that he has shown flashes of inconsistency throughout his career, and I think that was the biggest change that had happened for him to crack into that top four was the inconsistent performances. Um, but I think. Even with my, my uh, projected rankings for 2023, which I'm not really going to get into, I did drop Tarek Moen down to a seven, even though he's, I mean, I guess not dropping him down too much because he's ranked six right now in the world. But yeah, those are, those are my thoughts on Tarek Moen. Yeah, so in the early stages of his career, I remember he was kind of viewed a bit like, like Mazin is now, where he was a great shot maker. Mm-hmm. Everyone thought he was really dangerous. I remember him beating Nick Matthew when he was very young. In, I think in Qatar, um, and it was like, wow, this, this guy's really good, but he never really kicked on, certainly not in the next year or two. Um, but he was always like a constant threat. He was one of those guys that you didn't really want to draw early because you knew it would be a really tough match. But but if anything, his game has got very consistent re- recently. Mm-hmm. And now he just sort of, consi- I mean, when he was in the top four, he was making semis of nearly every event. Now he's probably making quarters more often than semis. Um, but I don't, I don't see that changing. I just, like I said, I don't know how he's going to challenge the, the guys above him. I see. Now, moving on to seven. Um, right now, currently ranked seven in the world is Joel Macon. Who so do you have is, at seven? This, I guess, would be my... It's not really a wild card pick because he's, he's demonstrated that he's more than capable, but I had Dasuki at number seven. Um, and again, he's, he's someone else. There's probably some question marks over his fitness. Um, he hasn't, he didn't play any events at the end of the last season. I don't think, I'm not sure what the issue was. Um, but, but he's someone that's had periods where he struggled with injuries, but at the same time, when he has been fit and healthy, I think he's shown that he's clearly a top eight player in the world. Um, if not higher. I mean, he's one of the few players that can actually, on his day, challenge those top, top players and even win big events. Saw that when he won Black Ball, I think, at the end of 2020. Um, and also this this year, he did win Canary Wharf and then went missing after that with injuries and inconsistent performances. But yeah, I, I agree with you with the Ferris Suzuki pick. I feel like at every season, no matter how much he's an injury plague, you got to always have him on and kind of gamble on him because of how good he is. If you're a Suzuki fan, do you think he might just be the most, the biggest disappointment considering he isn't reaching his potential? Because wouldn't you say his potential would be world number one? Or do you think he doesn't have that potential? Um, he's not shown to me that he's capable of being ranked world number one. I mean, Certainly, if you look at the two guys that have held that, Paul and Ali, over the last sort of 12 months, Mm -hmm. they're a lot more consistent. They're a lot less injury prone. Um, Their game, they're not as reliant on their sort of good days versus bad days. Um, And even on their bad days, I mean, it's rare. I guess Paul had a a loss to Victor this season, which was probably his bad day, but I can't remember the last time Ali lost to anyone that wasn't in the top sort of five or six in the world. Um, and Dasuki, every so often he'll have these, even when he's sort of fit, he'll, he'll have a loss. But again, he, he's shown much better consistency when he has been healthy. Um, but he's also going to face the problem of being seeded outside the top eight. So I was just looking at the draw for the first tournament of the season, which is Qatar. And he's drawn to play Asal in the last 16. So just to make the quarterfinals, he's going to have to beat Asal. So Asal, see, I think I took a glimpse at that draw as well. Asal has a brutal, brutal draw, doesn't he? I thought he, I think I saw him playing Marwan El Shabagi first round. Um, change up. I can look it up, but you might. Yeah, you might be right. Um, but yeah, that 
that to me, for him to get up into the, well, I've, like I say, put him at number seven, I think his biggest challenge mm. is going to be getting through some of those tough draws that he's going to get inevitably and making the most of the good draws when he does get them. Because that's the other thing. When you when you do get a draw that isn't quite as tough, there's a lot of pressure then to take advantage of that. And then that will hopefully get you the points you need to move up and then draws slightly become easier. Stuart, how big of a gamble was this to put Dazuki at seven? Would you say this was like the best case scenario of him to end the season at or, or no? No, I think he can... I don't think he'll get in the top four, but mm-hmm. like I say, I think he's just so good. If, if he stays injury free, I, there's no question in my mind that he is a top eight player. Um, so if he gets, if he breaks through into the top eight and he starts getting seeded at those events, I think he's going to be much, much more consistent at making quarters. And I think he's he's also one of the few guys that can threaten those guys above him. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm just looking at the draw, and I don't know if it's changed, but no, Sal has Kandra to play Dasuki as his draw. Oh, uh, it must okay, it must have changed. Um, uh, we need, we need, we need to address how terrible this new website is, and how slow this is <laughs> making <laughs> making my life incredibly difficult when uh, prepping up for episodes like this, and also just purely just watching squash has been not pleasant. Yeah. I had a couple of issues with every time you go on the, the new Squash TV site, you have to like log in. And it was, yeah, you're not, right. Not to constantly just complain about PSA, but this this made me so mad for the past past week since they launched. Since well, they also launched, they should like, launch this. You can't pause it when it's live, and then so I quite often will like watch it almost live, but maybe five or ten minutes behind. Um, and you can't. Really I do that I do the same. I if I am like really wanting to watch a match and it's live, I'll just rewind it and actually watch it from where I want to start it. But I can't do that anymore because they only rewind two minutes or something. Yeah, it's terrible. Exactly. I hope they listen in on this and make all the fixes that we're <laughs> addressing right now. I mean, well, I can't imagine they're not listening. <laughs> <laughs> um, moving on to six. Um, I actually have a lot of questions about your pick for six. Um, Right now, currently ranked six is Tarek Moman, but who do you have, Stuart? So I have uh, El Shabagi, Mohammed, um, at six. Uh, the next three players, basically four, five, and six, I think could go in any order. Um, mm-hmm. To me, there was a clear one, two, and three, and then there was a clear four, five, and six. Um, and I went with Shabagi just because... I still think there's question marks about whether he can sustain the sort of form he was showing at the end of last season. Um, I'm not convinced, which is obviously why I've put him at six, but um, I, I could also be wrong. You never really know with Shabagi, like what motivates him. I found it fascinating that um, the thing that he credited most for beating Paul at the Worlds was that article by Rob Owen. Like, um, so th- this could be dangerous right now of you calling him out of not being convinced. Uh, seems like Shrebaggy takes things very personally. Um, well, maybe this is the, the chip in his shoulder he needs to, to prove me wrong. If, if that is the case, please give the rally report a shout out in your post post game interviews, mm-hmm. as you do, whoever hurts your feelings. Um, I'll but yeah, no, I, I want a cut of his prize money as well. I mean, you, you can get the shout out. I want the prize money cut. I think the prize money would be more. Um, could I ask why you're not convinced by his performance? Because it's say you could say diehard fans for Baggy uh, make the argument that um, the last three, four, three events was pretty convincing of his comeback, making it to the semifinals and uh, winning the British National Championship. Because Joel making his no. Um, no easy opponent, and yeah, could you dig into why you're not convinced? I just think that he's, I mean, physically he's done well, but if you look at the the length of period he's been competing at the top and the intensity that he plays at, I think you can see minor signs of a sort of level of burnout and whether he has that desire to really push his body as hard as he needs to every single time he steps on court. Now, 
clearly at the end of the season, he had that. He had that fire back. Um, and I think he's one of those guys that plays his best when he has that. I think he almost needs it. But it must be just so draining to to rely on being that fired up for every match. And um, he's he's been doing it for over 10 years, I would say. Um, I actually made a note that last year was the first year since 2012 that he didn't win a major title. Like a That's a, yeah, I read that. That's a fucking wild statistic. I mean, it just shows yeah. how dominant he was. I, I mean, it's not like he's not, but yeah, that is a crazy statistic. Um, and I'm not he, sure if anyone's been at that level for that long. I mean, even even guys that you think of as sort of legends, like maybe Wilstrop, but I don't think Gauthier won a tournament every year because he had, he had very good spells where he was dominant, but then he also had seasons where he was just sort of four or five in the world, um, certainly in the earlier years. Uh, Matthew, I don't think, was winning major titles for that long. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that might be one of the longest streaks of major titles that there's ever been in the game. Sure. When it's all said and done, and when Mohamed El Shabagi retires, where where would you rank him on the all time greats? Do you think he's on that list without a doubt? Um, I mean, top ten of all time, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Top five, possibly. I would maybe put him around that sort of five, five or six. Maybe keep him at six, just because that's what I've got him in, in these rankings. <laughs> just for consistency. The consistency of six. Um, what would what would change that? What would change your with what's left of his career? Do you think it's the missing world championships? Yeah, I think he just missed a few majors. Like he won, um, he's only won one worlds, which, yeah. um, I mean, Farag's won three, which is crazy. Because to me, if you're talking about all time greats, then Shubagi is much higher than that list than Farag at this point in time. Mm-hmm. Um, Farag can certainly still go on and, and move up, whereas I'm not sure, I'm not sure Shubagi is going to achieve enough great things at this point in his career to really change his legacy. His legacy is pretty set. He's one of the best players, certainly of the last 10, 15 years. Certainly this, not just this generation, but he's spanned, he talks about this a lot and I totally agree with him. He's spanned multiple generations. He came on the scene at a time when like Linku and Palmer and Shibana were playing and, and he was competitive with them. And then he spanned the sort of uh, Rami, Matthew, Goti, um, probably missing somewhere, Wilstrop generation. And now he's mm-hmm. he's sort of seen off challenges from like Gawad for a little while. And then now Ali and Paul coming through. So, so it's a, it's a phenomenal career. Yeah. But um, yeah, I just, I don't know if he has what it takes to, to beat those guys regularly now. And sir, one more question is, do you, if you had to pick one side, because, I mean, there's a diplomatic answer to this. If you had to pick a side, do you think it's more so that his level has dropped off in the in the recent years or just the level of the men's field has risen? I think his level has dropped off, if I'm honest. I don't think he's at the, the same level as he was in his prime. Uh, to me, his prime was probably around 2016, 17, mm-hmm. maybe 18. Um but even, I mean, from I mean, his world, first Worlds final in 2012, and like I say, he was winning major championships that year. Or sorry, yeah, I mean, I think, if it weren't for Rami overlap, I'm sure he would be higher than six on the all-time great list. Yeah. Um, capturing more um, world championships. Um, so, no, I don't, I don't think he's at the level he was. I mean, he had one crazy season where I think he won something like seven platinum events in one year. Yeah. Um, I can't remember exactly what year that was, but I, I don't think there's any question that was his prime. Um, and I also don't think there's any question that he's he's not at that level now. Uh, I don't think he would even suggest that. Um, and and like I say, his game is just so physically demanding, but the, the mental side of getting himself to that level is probably what's taking the toll more than the physical side. Still looks pretty fit most of the time. He just he doesn't yeah. quite seem like he's willing to push his body as hard as he used to. Mm-hmm. Uh, moving on to five, 
I also thought this was quite of a gamble of a pick of yours, Stuart. Um, right now, currently ranked five in the world is Mohamed El Shabay that we just covered. But who do you have as your five? Well, I actually had forgotten about his recent loss to Shabagi in the British National Final. So thanks for making me doubt this one. But um, I had to discreetly drop that, <laughs> set this one up. But yeah, I've, I've got Joe Macon at number five. Mm-hmm. Um, to me, he's, he's almost the opposite of Shabagi in that he, see, he seems so hungry to get more, to, to challenge, to win major titles. I think I wouldn't be surprised if he won a big event this year. He's sort of been at the door. I don't think he's even made a final, but he's made semis. He's, he's shown that he can compete with the guys. I mean, I don't know if you watched the Commonwealth Games final, but I thought that I was did. an amazing match. Yeah. Um, and he also showed a different side to his game in that final. Can you, can you walk us through what, what you were able to identify in that final that seemed different from his, the past season that we've seen of him? Well, I've, I've always felt with Joel that he, he didn't want to take too much risk because he didn't want to give you anything. Um, and he was so confident in the, the work that he's done physically to prepare. Um, he feels like he can match just about anyone in that aspect. So, so it was almost like I'm not going to try and hit too many winners because the downside of that is that I can potentially make errors and I don't want to give you anything cheap. And I feel like that final against uh, Paul, he almost went in with the mindset of, well, I know that I might be able to live with him physically, but I'm probably not going to wear him down. So I have to do more. I have to take a little bit more risk and hopefully trust my racket skills. And you can see he's been working on that. He's, his game has been steadily improving. His short game has improved over the last few years. Just his overall level of ball control, like even when he slows down the pace, like that's not an easy thing to do to maintain your accuracy when you're hitting at different paces. And he's one of the best players on tour at that. Um, but yeah, I think he just, he trusted himself to take a bit more risk and it almost came off. I thought it was a brilliant match from both of them. I was really impressed with the way Paul sort of adapted throughout the match. I'm sure Paul wasn't going in expecting that from, from Joel. Um, yeah, that first game was, uh, and yeah, was a scare. I had no idea what I had fully thought Paul would win in three or four and then I don't know where Joel Macon. Did you did you think midway through watching that match that Joel Joel's gonna win? Or did you always know that Paul was gonna come back? I expected Paul to respond. Um, mm-hmm. and I think if he'd if it went too love, then it might have been tough. But um yeah, once Paul got into the match, it was clear that it was gonna just be a really tough match. But again, Joe continued to try and take the game, game on and the, the rallies did get longer and a bit more physical, but when he got chances, he he wasn't as hesitant. Not that hesitant's maybe the wrong word because um, I don't feel he was too hesitant. He just he always seemed to me that he played short with a, a margin and mm-hmm. it felt like he was willing to sacrifice that margin a little bit just because he knew he needed to, to win points and not just wait for errors. I personally think this is your biggest gamble of a pick, even though he's, he's just moved him up two spots from his current ranking. Yeah, potentially. I mean, mm-hmm. again, looking at his results, he's, just, he's so consistent. He's, he's only sort of what I've called bad loss all season was against Miguel at the British Open. I agree, yeah. Um, he's, he's finally cracked that sort of 8-9 barrier where he's he's getting those horrible draws and he's got in the top eight now. He has been in the top eight before, but I think he slipped out. I don't see him letting that happen again. Um and I, I think he's he's a man on a mission. He's he's someone that has ambitions to get even higher. He wants to I mean I, I suspect that he believes he can be number one in the world. I'm not sure I agree with that, but I love the fact that he's he's got a goal and he's doing everything he can to 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 work towards that. He's one he's one of my favorite players just in terms of his work ethic and his attitude and just mm-hmm. gets on with it. Like there's no bullshit with him. Yeah, that's that's interesting that you just said. Do you do, you don't think he has the potential to reach number one? What's holding him back? You think? Um, probably the ability to just beat guys 
consistently and quickly. Um, like one of the things that I'm amazed by was just how easily those top guys can get very, very good players off court. And Gauthier was the master at this in his prime. But even Ali Farag, like Ali Farag rarely plays for over 40 minutes in the first couple of rounds. I never watch Farag's Farag's games until he reaches semis because I just know he's going to make it. Um, yeah, I don't but think I ever tune in. Yeah, it's it's un, it's impressive, but it's underrated how impressive it is because mm-hmm. those are good players. Like you think he can play, play someone in the like between ten and twenty in the rankings in a second or third round, and he's beating those guys in like 35, 40 minutes. Like, they're very, very good players right. to be, can, and not just like when he plays well, like con- consistently that's just what happens when he plays in those earlier rounds. And I think that's one of the things that Paul improved last year is that he's started to do that to, to guys. He's having far fewer battles earlier on in the draws. Um, it's going to be interesting because Asal actually does have quite a lot of battles when he probably doesn't need them. Um mm-hmm. But he, he seems to be able to cope with it. And a lot of his sort of longer matches, there's a lot of like stop-start time in, in there. So he might actually be playing for 40 minutes, but with his 20 minutes of blocking and lets and arguing with the ref, it, it's a 60-minute match. Um, yeah. Um, well, we, okay, just going back to Joel Macon, I, I do want to say because Stuart's, not Instagram, not on Instagram because they've kicked him out. Uh, we uh, this is a public appeal happening right now that we need to submit because that's nonsense. But I always found it funny and a great and a really impressive that Joel making posts all his workouts and his training on his Instagram. And I think he doesn't give a fuck about people looking at what he's doing. And it's just you can't replicate what he's doing, especially the physical training he puts in. And I think it's pretty cool that he just puts that all out in the open. Yeah, it's, it's almost like a challenge. It's like, here's what I'm doing. You want to try it? Good luck. Like, yeah, you're not going to You're going to get injured doing it. It's like, I, I think he almost wants guys to try it because he knows that they'll probably break down and get injured. <laughs> it's such a tease. He's just doing like uh, one-legged squats with weights on and doing these circ- nonsense circuits. But yeah, it's great that he's showing everything yeah. of what he's I, doing. I love his approach to the game overall. I mean, I actually remember Joel as a junior and um, I think most people know he wasn't a great junior. He was actually probably a better junior than he gives himself credit for. Mm-hmm. Um, and certainly towards the end of his junior career, like around the age of 18, he was starting to show some really good potential by that point. Probably not top 10 in the world potential, but he's just a hard worker who gets on with things. He's not looking for any favors. Yeah. I've got so much respect for him. Yeah. Um, moving on to now the four, the top four, I think is very cemented. I would would doubt anyone would move these, any of these four outside, but why don't we start with four? Uh, who do you have currently is Diego Elias at four, but who's your pick? Well, first off, I'll say that Mohamed El Shabagi and Joe Macon would probably move this guy out of the top four. (laughs) You think so? In their mind, I mean. Mm. I don't think so, which is why I've, I've put Diego at four. But I'm sure if you ask Joe if he thinks he'll be in the top four, he'll say yes. And if you ask Shabagi if he'll be in the top four, he would also say yes. So there's there's two people that disagree with us straight away. But yeah, I think um, I think Diego's started to show his potential. He obviously won his first Platinum Series event last year. Um, he had his most consistent season on tour um, by quite a long way. Um, I made a note that he actually, outside of Paul, Ali, and Asal, he only lost to two players last season. And that was, uh, he lost to Shibagi at the World Tour Finals, which I'm guess, not, yeah. I, yeah, I guess you can argue whether that even counts because it's, it's sort of an exhibition event, but not yeah. really. Like, it's a bit more than that, but some of the results there can be a little bit quirky. Do you uh, like that event on a side note, or do you think there needs to be changes? Made on no, that I, I actually do like it um, mm-hmm. because every match is between two top eight players. Um, I actually I loved it when it was the first or it was one of the first events back after COVID because it, it to me, I, I understand why it's at the end of the season, 
I think it would be a great opening event to the season. Um, oh, interesting. Yeah, I mean, it makes more sense to have it at the end of the season because it's sort of it's a World Tour finals that you qualify across the course of the season. Mm-hmm. But what I do you think, think would the appeal be to start it off with that event? I just think it would be a great way to get the season started with the top eight players going up against each other. Um, there's a little. It feels like there's a little bit less on the line. Like um, I think guys go into the event obviously trying to win it, but then once they've lost. Um, you get some weird m- matches. You always get that weird situation where one guy maybe doesn't want to win his group because in the other group there's been a wonky result and like F- Ali Farag had yeah. lost a pool match so, and then he finished second in his group. So then if you win your group, you have to play him in the semis. So you're, you'd rather lose and finish second. Like you always get weird scenarios. Like yeah, that. probably the most amount of thinking these squash players would have to do. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, I I do like the format. Um, I know I think it's taken from tennis. Tennis has the same thing. But mm-hmm. yeah, I think it would be a great little like season opener. But I I don't expect them to change that. Um, but yeah, Diego. Going back to Diego, his his only a real bad loss across the the whole season, and it was a pretty bad one to be fair. <laughs> yeah, it was <laughs> was uh, <laughs> losing to Iker Pajares in the Wind City Open. Um, oh. But he didn't lose to anyone right below him outside of that. Um, I'd love to know if there was an issue there or if he maybe went in sort of underprepared or maybe not expecting a tough match. Uh, were you able to watch that match? Cause it, no, I don't remember it at it's, all. It's on, it's on YouTube. It, he caused a huge, huge ruckus at the, at the end. I think there were some co- controversial decisions and stuff, and he went, he went ballistic. And it's quite entertaining to see his reaction. After this loss, interesting. Um, so even th- for those of you out there who's listening, and go find that match because it is pure entertainment with how he reacts. Diego, I would. I also do like Diego a lot. He doesn't really hide his hide how he feels. He'll say that it, how it is. So do appreciate that about him. Um, yeah, I think for me the big thing with Diego is can he go? A st- I've obviously said that I had Diego, Joel Macon, and Shabagi in a pretty similar bracket. Mm-hmm. Um, Diego at four out of those. I think the real interesting one is can he actually go beyond that and and challenge the the guys above him consistently? Like can he can he win more platinum events? Can he make finals? Can he beat Paul and Ali and Asal regularly? Or even even if he had a fifty fifty head to head with them, that would be a real sign of progress for him. Yeah, I mean, he particularly does not seem to have figured out the homework of how to beat Farag nor Asal. I don't think he has beaten. He he's really a, has he's beaten a lot for with, Yeah, he's a lot better with yeah. Paul. Um, mm-hmm. I think him and Paul have known each other for a lot longer, and I think they're pretty even in head to heads. Um, What's Diego, lacking in Diego's game that isn't allowing him to progress into that top three, you think? Um, I'm actually. Yeah, I'm not sure. Because he has everything, he moves brilliantly. Um, he's he's another guy that can can get through the early rounds fairly comfortably most of the time. Um, historically, everyone's commented on just he's not fit enough to play sort of three really tough matches. But um, I think you're seeing that being less of an issue. Mm-hmm. I, I suspect he's still not as physically strong as some of the other guys up at that level. Um, and maybe he can't. Maybe he can't do that every tournament. And play. I mean, I'm not sure how he would cope if he had to play Paul and then Asal or Paul and then Ali back to back. Um, but yeah, I I think he's very close. And some someone like him, the summer can be really important because that's when you can put in that physical work to to get stronger. Um, I don't know if he's been posting his workouts on Instagram, but if he has, see, I'm I mean, the, from the rumbles I've heard, I don't want to say anything concrete, but I heard the biggest thing with him is he enjoys he enjoys the uh, summers a little too much, and also just enjoys life a little too much for the commitment to, I guess, break into that top three. But yeah, historically, I know that's been the case, but whether he's matured and maybe 
cut down on that. I've no idea. I don't know. I don't know where he's been training over the summer. I don't know if he's been back in Peru or if he's. I think he's at been... Kinetic down in Florida. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which I don't know. I think if you want to party down in Florida, you could probably find <laughs> plenty of opportunities. But... It's not the greatest <laughs> outside environment. But he's, he's certainly shown just the way he talks in interviews. Like he seems more committed to it and mm-hmm. more willing to knuckle down and put the work in and maybe make a few more sacrifices to, to achieve. I think he's starting to realize that he's not going to have another 10 years to achieve great things. So it's either now or never. I think, yeah. I think when you're young, when you're 21, 22, you, you sort of look at life of, as having, Oh, I've got so much time to achieve things. It will happen eventually. And then when you get to sort of, I don't know what he's 26 now, I think. Um, yeah. He's 25. Some, 25 coming up yeah. to 26 yeah um but maybe at that age you start to realize that maybe maybe you don't have all this time ahead of you maybe you need to start achieving things now so well i, I, I certainly i think he hasn't matured quite a lot um and even the way he's playing squash is a little bit more sort of mature mm-hmm. so. well wa- want to move on to the the grand top three um which I, th- I found it cool that both of us had switched it around a little bit from what the rankings say. Um, right now, currently ranked three in the world is Mustafa Saul. Who do you have as three in the world by the projected 2023? So I struggled with this because um, I think all three of them, there's an argument that any of them can come out on top um, at the end of the season. You've obviously, the three players that are in contention are obviously Paul, Ali, and Asal. Um, I've actually put Paul at three. Uh, that might be unfair, um, and I wouldn't be entirely surprised if he ends up proving me wrong and getting back to number one this season. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's so little between those those three guys. I think a lot of it will come down to um, how the draws pan out and who can get through to the later stages a little bit fresher, um, which partly depends on how they are playing and also partly who they come up against and how they are playing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't really see anyone consistently challenging those. Diego is obviously the most likely. Um, but I just think Paul, Ali and Asal are a little bit ahead of them still. So uh, given all that, I, I wanted to re- hear your reason why you put, why you ended up, even though it's a very tough decision, why you ended up putting Paul at three. <laughs> What was the deciding factor there? It came down to, it was less to do with him and more to do with the other two. Mm. Um, one, because I think, I think Asal is going to be incredibly tough to beat this year. Um, I think some of the squash he showed at the end of last season suggested he was the best player in the world those last couple of events. Um, and Ali's always tough to beat. So I don't see, I don't think Paul's level is going to drop. Um, I don't think his game is going to go down in any way. I just, um, I just thought the other two are going to have slightly better seasons. Um, but yeah, I think Paul wins some big events. I think uh, just to, to reaffirm what what Rob Owen said, I think when he gets everything right, I still think he can beat anyone in the world, and mm-hmm. I have no doubt that he'll win at least one or two big events this season. Um, it is interesting. Do you, so, would you say the gap between the three players are very interchangeable, and these rankings could, yeah, really go that, up and down? I mean, it's, it's definitely going to come down to consistency. It's going to be who can make, who can win the most titles, and who can make the most finals. Mm-hmm. Um, I think most, like, I think most events, you're going to have those three in the semifinals with one other player. That might be Diego, it might be Joel occasionally, it might be Dasuke if he's playing well, like it could be anyone, but but I think it's going to take a lot for people to beat those top three. Um, I see. Well, I guess it's pretty self-explanatory who the two and one is going to be, but why don't we move on to two? Who have you put down? Right now it's ranked two is Paul Cole, but who's your pick? So I feel like it's almost like a chart countdown. Like if I give away the number two, I'm basically giving away the number one as well. So, um, but yeah, at, at two I've got Ali, and that obviously means at one I've got Asal. But mm-hmm. 
Um, yeah, I think Ali again will be very hard to beat. Um, I know like last year he played 14 events. I think he won the most events of anyone on tour, certainly like the most big events. Um, so he won, by my calculation, he won six events. He only lost uh, eight matches all season and four of them were to Paul. So, um, yeah, I mean, and that's one of the consistency. Yeah. One of the weird things about Paul is that he actually had a really good record against Ali, but then he lost three times to Diego and he lost to El Shabagi and Victor. And, um, if you look at Farag's losses last year, he lost four to Paul. He lost twice to Sal and then once to Marwan and once to Joe. Um, oh, wow. So, yeah, I, again, it's really hard to separate. Um, and he, he's had the, the edge over Asal for most of his career, but um, I think you saw a little bit that Asal was starting to figure him out. It seemed um, like, yeah, you had to figure in the last two events. Yeah. But even if, I mean, his head, I didn't realize this until I was looking, doing some research for this, but even though he had beaten Asal, I think four times in a row, every one of those matches was either three, two, or there was one that was a best three that was two, one. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like he was beating him convincingly. They were all going to the wire. Um, and I, I think Asal is going to start to win more and more of those matches. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I struggle to see people beating us out on a regular basis going forward. Who do you think has the better game to, for us all in terms of Paul Cole and Ali Farag? I mean, Ali's record is definitely better. Um, mm -hmm. he, Asal actually, the first sort of big player that he had success against was Paul. So even when he was coming up and was, I don't know if he was just inside the top 10 or just outside the top 10, but, but I remember him having a couple of big wins against Paul early on. So he obviously does well, but then I think Paul figured him out and went away. And um, again, when Paul was playing that, that spell, when he won the British Open and he beat everyone through love, um, I think Asal was one of his opponents in that event. And, yep. Um yeah, if, if Paul plays, well, I, I don't see anyone in these amongst these three dominating. Like I, I expect their head to heads to be like three two, four all, like something something like that. Mm -hmm. I'd be very surprised if if they played three or four times and one player amongst those three won every time. So in my, I mean, I guess we're kind of also transitioning into Assal. Where, I mean, we can talk both about Assal and Farag, but I, I personally think Assal's entering into the unbeatable territory, and I think that might progress uh, midway through this season. I think just the way he finished off last season was a little bit scary to the entire tour. Yeah, the although dispatching. there's been very few players that have, I mean, I thought that for a while about Shabini on the women's side, but Mm. She was becoming unplayable and she would win everything. And it re never really happened. I mean, I guess it happened with Nicole David on the women's side. And then you could say Jyoti had a brief spell where it happened and Rami had a an extended spell where it happened for him. Uh, I don't see it, even though I've got a solid one, I don't see it happening with him. I don't think he's going to win like six out of 10 events this season. Um I'd be surprised that if there's sort of 10 major events, I'd be surprised if anyone wins more than three or four. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because I, I just think all those guys are just so good that um, I, no one's going to be completely dominant in my mind. I think Ali will certainly beat us all. Paul will probably beat him. Uh, Ali and Paul will probably have some wins over each other. So um, yeah. a lot actually could come down to not how they fare against each other, but also if any of them lose to any of the guys below them. Because that, and they're a bunch coming up. Well, that's where the rankings really penalise you. Like, if you lose in a quarterfinal, mm -hmm. um, it, it's a big difference. Like, the weighting of winning events is pretty significant. So you're actually, you're better off winning two events and losing in two semis than making four finals, just in terms of the ranking points. Uh. 
Um, uh, just, do you want to quickly get into what you feel about the uh, the way the rankings are set up? Any flaws you think that need to need to be fixed, or you think it, it should be just how it is right now? Well, I heard your most recent guest talking about this lower down the rankings, and I completely mm-hmm. agree. I haven't seen the letter that you referenced, but um, I think you made some great points about the difficulty of cracking into the top fifty. Um, and how you basically have to dominate on the Challenger Tour just to get into some of these platinum events. So I think that's I think that's one thing that PSA could look at, and it's obviously on the radar. So I hope that they are. Um, but yeah, it's, it's too easy for those guys that are like forty to fifty in the world, and they're getting into those events that are just picking up points for showing up and losing first round. Um, okay. Yeah, getting to get your place, stay your place there. I, the one you know what? I'm going to call out one player that I think has been doing this is Lucas Serm. I think he's just consistently never budging out of that um, spot he's in. I think he's around 40. I feel like there are players below him who should be above him, but that's just okay. my opinion. I think there's plenty of players, actually. <laughs> I'm being honest, I think there's, uh, there's actually – so there used to be maybe one or two guys that you thought were doing that and then maybe one or two guys that were kind of stuck below that. Now it feels like there's almost 10 players that are stuck below that can't get into those tournaments, and there's maybe 10 guys that are stuck in the the higher spots. Mm-hmm. Um, but, I mean, if you look, you've got guys like... Um, <laughs> I know a few, of these, a few of these guys might not be around for too long, but... Uh, Alan Klein has probably not won too many matches recently in those big events, but he's mm-hmm. been getting into them all. He's actually just taking the job as the assistant coach at Princeton. So I guess he's uh, stepping away. I don't think he's planning to continue playing that much longer. Um, but then you've got like Dimitri Steinman doesn't tend to win too, too many of those matches. Even like Todd Harity, um, Abdul Al Tanimi, like they're all ranked between forty and fifty. Little did I know by me dropping Lucas Serm's name that we just get a bomb of names from Stuart right now. <laughs> yeah. You, you can offend one person, I'll offend four. <laughs> Thank always appreciate you balancing it out for me, not putting me in a tough spot. But yeah, let's well that, there you have it. That rounds out the top ten for the men. And let's why don't we move on to the woman? I've personally found doing the woman's one a lot more interesting um, when building the list. But well, there's just some quite, different factors in it. That There's quite a few similarities in that I felt like, I don't know about you, but I felt that like there was a clear top three and it was a mm-hmm. case of which order they go in. Um, then I actually felt like there was a pretty clear five, four, five, six. You could One of those players, you could argue, might get into the top three. <coughs> um, and then it was pretty open after that. With, with a mix of like young players moving up and older, more established players trying not to move down too fast. Um, I, I personally found the four through eight very difficult for this list. One yeah, building. I found seven and eight hard, but seven and eight. I wasn't, I didn't find it too hard before that. Um, mm-hmm. And you've not actually seen my list here. So, which is why I am very excited to see what, which names are going to be dropped here. Um, yeah, well, well, let's start into 10. It seems like 9 and 10 were pretty relatively easy for Stuart to pick. Who do you have at 10? We're currently ranked 10 in the world is Olivia Ficker from USA. Yeah, so Victor. 9 and 10 were not easy. Um, and again, I mentioned this on the men's side, but it's, it's a little bit similar here where mm. I think Olivia Ficker is a player who is probably playing the best squash of her life, is probably going to continue improving, She's at her highest ever ranking of 10, and yet she has not made my top 10, even though she might improve. And the reason for that is because I don't think there's any doubt that El Tayeb is... Oh, right. she, she's back. She is fully back. Well, she's 11, so she's going to move yeah. up into the top 10, which then means someone in the current top 10 has to move down. <laughs> um, and yeah, you've, you've got a few other players that are clearly still improving, like Neil Gillis, Tina Gillis, Nada Abbas is another young player moving up. Mm-hmm. Um, hopefully she gets back after her accident over the summer, Siva Subramaniam is another player. Um, 
<laughs> but it's just it's going to be really tough for any of those players to get into the top ten because most of the top ten players are established and deserving of that spot. So at ten, I've actually and I did this before today's final between um, El Tayeb and Salmahani, but I put Salmahani at number ten. Um, I think I watched most of the final today, and that actually that made me feel more convinced that, about this pick because <laughs> I did have some doubts. Like I say, there's there's a, a number of players behind her that could challenge for that place, mm-hmm. but I thought she looked good. Um, she she was playing good squash, nice balance, like attacking at the right times. Um, she was the only player that really tried to take the game to El Tayeb. Um, Throughout the entire tournament, yeah. I didn't agree. let El Tayeb just dictate and dominate the rallies. Like I watched uh, El Tayeb yesterday against Neil Gillis and Oh, the squash lesson. That was it happening. was one-way traffic. Yeah, that was, that was a... Doesn't ask what thing. Uh, <laughs> Whereas you could you could sense that Salma came in with a game plan. Like um, one of the things El Tayeb likes to do is attack you and wait for you to hit it back to her. Mm-hmm. And every time um, El Tayeb played that forehand boast into the front backhand corner, I thought Salma played that counter drop brilliantly um, and really kept her honest, as I would say. What do you think Salma needs to do to? advance further into the rankings uh, into the top 10 because she she has been in the top 10 now this past season and well, she seems not too happy with how her season went last yeah I'm last year she had she had she needs to be more consistent she had too many random bad losses um mm. so i made a note that she lost last year she lost to silver subramanian which isn't a terrible result but if, if you want to be a top 10 player you tend to you have to win those matches but then Beyond that, she lost to Joshna Chinapa, she lost to Aifa Asman and Holly Norton. And there, there's not many other girls in the top 10 that lost four matches to players mm-hmm. outside the top 10 like that. Um, maybe one of those defeats would be absolutely fine to the most. But, but yeah, it's actually it's impressive that she held on to that top 10 spot with those losses. Um, but yeah, she, she looked like she was playing better. Um, and I, I do think she's just about got enough in her game to hold off the challenge from those girls that I mentioned behind her. I see. All right. Now moving on to nine, currently ranked nine is as we were just mentioning her, Sal Mahani. Who do you have at nine? Uh, so number nine, I've got Rowan El Arabi. Let's Which see that is, our lists are aligned so far. It's a slightly strange one because. She's a young player. She she's someone you would expect to be moving up the rankings. Mm-hmm. Um, she's actually she's at seven right now. That, yeah, yeah. So she's Drop only down 20, two spots. Twenty two years old, and you wouldn't expect someone at twenty two to be moving down the rankings. But um, I just I think that El Tayeb and Georgina Kennedy are going to go past her, mm-hmm. and I'm not sure. She's she's going to be able to. I mean, Joelle King and Sarah Jane Perry are the two players that I think she'll be competing with to to get in the top eight. Um, but yeah, I think their experience and consistency will be a little bit um, a little bit more than Ruan. It is. It, it could uh, be a shock to the to people out there, as you mentioned about a young player who's already ranked seven in the world to move down. What do you think in her game is missing? Because it'd be obvious for a young player to have that trajectory where upwards, but what, what do you think is missing in her game? It- I still haven't seen enough in her game to tell me that she's a real contender or a real threat to those top players. Um, I think the way she plays is fun to watch, but uh, she can hit some great shots. I like the way she moves. She sort of glides around the court, but Sometimes she's not as solid as she needs to be. Um, yeah, I just, mm-hmm. I don't see, I, I know she had a really good junior career. She actually beat Hanya in a couple of World Juniors finals. But to me, it's pretty obvious that Hanya's game has improved more. You also don't really see the uh, 
the fire in Rowan c- compared to some of the other top girls in the top eight, I'd say. I think that's something that I haven't seen. And I think that's, I mean, you alluded to Hania. She's the complete opposite. But yeah, it's just my opinion about it. But moving on to eight, the top eight, we got currently ranked eight in the world is Gina Kennedy. Who do you have at eight at the end of the season? Oh, it's not Gina Kennedy. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, I had Joelle King at eight. Um, mm-hmm. And she had a, a great season last year. She was consistent. She was yep. basically making quarters and semis of every event. She had a really good run in sort of March, April, where she made uh, semis at Windy City, then Blackball, then the British, and then she won the Manchester Open, which wasn't a top-tier event. But she she did have some good wins. I think she beat Amanda twice. She beat uh, SJ twice. So, so yeah, she, she's... Uh, I mean, she's almost 34 years old, but she doesn't seem like she's falling away. She's another player, like we talked about on the men's side, that's that's been good with her body. Um, apart from, I think she had a pretty bad Achilles issue, but six, uh, actually probably seven or eight years ago now. Mm-hmm. Um, but apart from that, she always seems pretty fit and healthy um, and she moves well. So I don't see any reason why her level will necessarily drop. I just... I don't think she's she's going to be a top four or five player anymore. How much did the, her Commonwealth g- Games results affect your decision to uh, put her down at eight? Because it is a big drop down as someone who's ranked five in the world right now to be on the projected list at eight. Yeah. I mean, a big part of it, as I've mentioned already, was Taya coming back and mm-hmm. – I think Georgina Kennedy is going to, I mean, Georgina won the Commonwealth pretty convincingly. Um, and Joel and SG as well were in those draws. Um, so part of it's just that. I found it quite hard to separate her and SG. SG is my number seven pick. Mm-hmm. Um, but there really wasn't much between them. They're, they're pretty even. Uh, Joel actually has has a slight edge when they play, I think. Uh, although SJ did win their Commonwealth Games bronze medal match, but but even that, I think Joel was two love up, and then SJ ended up winning at fourteen twelve in the fifth. So so it's not like there's a lot between them, right? Um, but yeah, well, yeah. Why end, don't we Why don't we talk about that um, seventh pick with SJ? She's currently ranked six in the world. Um, you don't really see her moving up the rankings. No, I, I don't. I just think the I mean, the, the top three or four players are certainly better than her. Um, mm-hmm. I think Amanda's playing really well and is probably likely to stay at that level. Um, and as I've said, Georgina Kennedy's clearly moving up. So so it's hard to see uh, SJ getting into that mix, uh, similar to Joel, like I said. like she, Her level might stay the same. She might even end up playing potentially better squash and dropping down the rankings. Um, Yeah. Well, why don't we move on to number six in the world right now? It is SJ Perry, but who do you have as six? So number six, I've got Amanda, um, (laughs) which uh, she similar to my number six pick in the men's side, El Shabagi, this, this might fire her up to prove me wrong. Um, (laughs) which I would be more than happy to be proven wrong because mm-hmm. uh, I like her game. Um, and, yeah, it's, it's great for U.S. squash as much as anything to see someone doing well. I've already I've already slighted Olivia Victor by saying she's going to move outside the top ten. So uh, Not the greatest fan of Team USA out here, clearly. <laughs> yeah, so it seems, <laughs> which is not true, actually. Um, I'm a big fan of Team USA. I would almost call myself an American when it comes to squash these days. Um, but, yeah, I mean, she was she was in top four most of the season. She got to number three in, um, in the first half of the season, and mm-hmm. then she's basically sat at number four since then. Um, but, yeah, one of the, one of the interesting things I, I noticed looking through her results was that she hasn't actually beaten any of the big three, if you want to call them that, so... Our head-to-head yeah. last season against Gohar was uh, five nothing in Gohar's favor. 
She was 0-2 with Shabini and bizarrely she didn't actually play Hanya last year. Um, but yeah, I, th- I think that's that's kind of the problem with, with Amanda's game is that she's a, another player who's very good at dispatching the players ranked below her. But if she wants to move up, then she probably has to beat those girls a- ahead of her. And so far she hasn't shown that she can do that. Um, certainly not consistently. Wow, I this is this is crazy to me. I, I don't, I have no idea how far you think Gina Kennedy is going to move up the rankings. But I'm curious to see where she's at right now. Um, so six at Amanda. Who do you have at five? So at number five, I have Gina. Um, I swear to you that you were going to put her up at one or something, but um, not quite. No. <laughs> what What made you decide to put Gina Kennedy above Amanda? That's a good question, actually. I just, I think that um, she has more tools to to threaten the pl- players above her. I mean, um, when I've seen her play those girls, she's she struggled against Gohar, actually. Um, she's done okay against Shibini. And the player she actually matches up best with, because she can match the physicality, is probably Hanya. Um because she's as fast as Hanya, if not faster. Mm-hmm. She can she can run for as long and she can sort of the long rallies don't phase her. So so I feel like if she's gonna get a win over one of those top three, it's probably gonna be Hanya first. Um and I think probably in the other end of that, I think the one that she'll struggle with for the longest is probably Shabini because um Shabini's got the ability to just move her around the court and control the rallies. Um I see. But I, I think, again, she's – I look at her in a similar way to Joe Macon in that she's she's clearly working on things. Like, her game is – every time you watch her, her short game seems better. She looks more composed on the ball. Like, when she first came on co- uh, on tour, you were amazed by, like, the pace that she played at, but it looked quite frantic. <laughs> um, it never looked like she was composed and in control. And now she now she's still playing at that same pace, but she looks more comfortable with it. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So, what had impressed you the most in her performance in the Commonwealth Games? Probably how she dealt with the pressure. Having, mm. I mean, she was quite open about the fact that for the entire year leading up to that, her main goal was to make the England team because um, each country can only take. Uh, I think you can take nine players in total so you can take four men and five women or five uh, men and four women mm-hmm. um, but I think England squash only took four women if I'm right um, and I think uh, SJ was probably always going to get picked as I think they were always going to take Alison Waters as a sort of doubles specialist Yeah, and then you had players like uh, Lucy Tormel Tourme- who when you had Jazz Hutton, um, probably had um, one or two others just outside that. So, so from where she started at like 160 something in the world, you basically had to get up, up to the top 30 and close to top 20 in the world just to make the team. And to do that, yeah, and to come in as um, a sort of a genuine, even though she was the number three seed, I think everyone knew that she had a chance of winning it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then to to meet that expectation and handle the pressure when she she is still quite inexperienced. Um, mm-hmm. She hasn't played on the tour for that long, and she certainly hasn't played the big sort of squash TV. I mean, I've played the Commonwealth Games, and it is by far the biggest event I ever played in my life. Um, significantly more um, more daunting than World Championships or. I never it's just played the anything, atmosphere but... it brings upon with the audience and the, yeah, the and meaning you, and you get, Yeah, I mean, for us, we were, I think the, the capacity in Birmingham was 1,700 or 1,800 people. Um, when I played in Glasgow, it was over 2,000, I believe. Um, Holy you shit. Sh- yeah. You show up for a random first round match um, and it's packed <laughs> because... Um, unheard of in the PSA. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's not a squash audience. It's um, it's people that are just buying tickets to go and watch like high level sports, sort of like 
it's like having the Olympics. Um, people just buy tickets so that they can say that they've gone to the Olympics. So same with the Commonwealth Games. So, so for her to deal with all that, um, and there's additional media interest, both leading up to the event and during it. Um, so I think that's the thing that impressed me the most. And that's also one of the reasons I think she's going to continue to, to do well on tour is that she seems to handle that well. She seems like a pretty grounded person. I know her coach, Ben Ford, reasonably well. Um, mm. and he's a great guy, a very good influence. Um, so yeah, I, I don't see her going anywhere for a long time. Wow. Well, I guess the real test really lies ahead now for her. She's really uh, moved up, blows, blown everyone's expectations out the window. But I think now's the real test with people above her. But um, why don't we move up to number four? Currently is Amanda Sobe at four. But who do you have as four by the end of the season? So number four, I've got El Tayeb. Um, yep. And I was... I was thinking, like, could she go even higher? I know her highest ranking of her career was number three. I think she said quite openly that her goal is to match that and better it. Um, I'm not ruling it out. I just, um, yeah. She did she, beat Han- she beat Hanya twice last season, including <laughs> at the Worlds. So she absolutely can be competitive with those girls. Um but yeah, it's, it's really a case of can she go beyond that? She looks good. She looks like she's. Do you think she's looking better than she was before? Uh, I or think not, she's looking same. at the same level now. Okay. Um, I still think there's a few things that she needs to to improve in her game. I still think that she she can let people back into games when she's ahead. She can make sort of errors that like she'll have a three, four point lead and then she'll sort of give them a couple of quick points. Um, and she gets away with that most of the time because if you're that much better than your opponent, it's not as costly, but, um, little runs like that and lap season concentration, whatever they might be, they, they can be costly when you're playing get girls like Shabini and Gohar and, and they don't really give you that. Maybe mm-hmm. Shabini does sometimes, but Gohar certainly doesn't. So, so to be giving away sometimes three or four points in a game and having to make that up can be can be tough. Yeah, well, I, I'm just excited that she's back and giving that top three some trouble because they've really cemented themselves as the big three. But I think it's not a crazy statement to say no longer with really her return. But... I guess now we're really moving into the top three. Similar issue with as the men, I'm assuming. Just one final thing on Altaya. Like she's an exciting player to watch. So so it's even if she doesn't crack the top three, like she'll certainly give it a go and um she brings a different style of squash to to the top three. Yeah. Um so yeah, I, I really enjoy watching her play. So I'm excited to to watch some of those matchups. Yeah, I know. I mean, before even before when she left the game for a bit due to her kid, um, she was giving all of them, uh, Noral Shabini and Gohar some trouble. It was just Raneem was on the, on the top of the game at the time. Yeah, it was it was Shabini and Raneem at that point. I think yeah. she was probably above Gohar um, mm-hmm. at that point. But yeah, but I, excited I mean, to see her. Yeah, Gohar has definitely moved on from back then. <clears throat> So who do you have as three? I'm actually very curious how you mix these up. So uh, people that know me will be actually quite disappointed in me because I'm known <laughs> as her biggest fan. But at number three, I've got Nur El Shabini. Um, wow. This was, this was hard for me because... Um, I did not expect that. No. And, um, and again, it's similar to Paul. It's, it's, it's less a reflection on her and more a reflection... I mean, I'll explain when I get to my number one, I'll explain why I've gone for her at number one. But mm-hmm. um, I, I think both the other two are so fired up for every single match, every single event. Yeah. That matching that consistency and that, um, that level of intensity is going to be really tough. 
Um, I still think Shabini on her day is the best player in the world. I still expect her to, I mean, she'll probably show up and win worlds. She'll probably win one or two other events, but um, she just, anytime the world championships come up, she just decides like, okay, yeah, no one's, no one's beating me here. Um, but, but I'm not sure she can men. I don't know if it's mental or physical, but I'm not sure she can sustain that throughout the year. Um, one interesting dynamic is it seems that Hania has kind of, kind of, I don't, I don't think no one's ever going to actually crack the code of how to beat her, but Hania seems to be able to beat her, but still go hard to this day seems to struggle. Yeah. Well, um, I've got a record of the head to head. So she being lost, she only lost five matches last year. She played, uh, I think she played 10 events. She won five of them. And, uh, she lost twice to Gohar and three times to Hanya. And that was it. Didn't lose to a single player outside those two. Oh um, my goodness. But her head to head, she only actually beat Hanya once in four. So they played four times and it was three one Hanya. Mm -hmm. Um, she played, uh, Gohar five times and it was three two to Shabini. So, so I guess I'm a little wrong with my statement of, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. I still think that's an outrageous pick, Stuart, to put her at three. But <laughs> this is one where I definitely hope I'm wrong because she is by far my my favorite player. What, what about your game? Really, do you, are you a big fan of? Despite you putting her at three, <laughs> I mean, I love her squash, but I love even more just her demeanor on court. I think I've said this before, but I think for someone to be that good at a young age. Like we're talking about, we're going to get on to talking about world juniors and the mm -hmm. fact that a 15 year old won the worlds. Shabini won the worlds at 13. Third. Like that is one, it's possibly the most impressive achievement in all of squash. Mm -hmm. I remember in the U S people were freaking out when Marina won the under 19 nationals at 13. Now Hold on, there's this girl, Noriel Shabini who won the whole yeah. thing. <laughs> Now we expand that to the entire world. There isn't a yeah. single 18 year old in the world better than you. And you're 13. Like, um, uh, yeah, but yeah, the pressure that that brings. And then she obviously had success. Like she made the British open final like seniors at 16 lost to Nicole David, but she's never seen phased by it. Like she, she deals with pretty from, from what I can tell, not exactly great problem, like great issues with her body. She's constantly got a niggle here or there. She handles it with grace. She, she knows how to get the best out of herself, especially when it matters. Like I think that side of her character is almost more impressive than her squash. Her squash is phenomenal, but um, I think if you look at other sports like teen prodigies or teen phenomenons, mm. how often do they actually live up to the hype? And, I mean, and she yeah, I, I know we're going to talk about the World Juniors about giving a kid too much media attention and how that could be a little too much for someone to, at a young age. And I, I think yeah. we all know who I'm talking about here, but that kid's uh, much older than when El Shabini won the World Champs. Yeah, so that's what I love about her the most is that she seems very humble. She seems, um, I mean, I, I don't know what her career prize money is, but in, in squash terms, she's done very, very well for herself. <laughs> Like, she's not she's not a billionaire, but she's certainly a millionaire, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. um, but she she just sort of floats around. She seems very friendly with the other girls. Like uh, no one no one really has a bad word to say about her. Which yeah, um, I think it's important been... that we say that before we move on to the next two. <laughs> that was exactly, this list. exactly what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> yeah, in complete contrast to to the next two that we're going to talk about. But, I mean, all this sweet talk, all I'm hearing is that she's three, not buying it. Um, but, okay, well, why don't we move on to, I don't know who you got, who you got at two, but who do you have at two? Right now is El Shabini ranked, but who's your pick? So at two, I've gone for Hanya. And um, the reason is because I think Hanya is more vulnerable against the other girls. So again, mm. talking about their head to head, uh, Gohar won, Gohar won five of their eight matches last year, which, I mean, considering Gohar played 14 events, she played Hanya in eight of those 14 events, which 
really added to the rivalry, <laughs> so, mm. shall we say, um, <laughs> as if that rivalry needed anything added to it. Um, <laughs> Hanya did win the last two he played. Um, so Hanya seems like she's figured it out a little bit, but, but Gohard didn't really lose to anyone else. I think she mm-hmm. lost once in NetSuite to Salma Hani. And outside of that, similar to Shabini, she only lost to Shabini and Hanya. Whereas I see. Um, Hanya lost a couple of times to Taeb. She lost once to Joel. Um, and she also just, she it felt like she was more vulnerable against those other girls. I've already said, like, I, f- I feel like if Gina Kennedy is going to get her first big win against a top three player, it'll probably come it against be. Hanya first. Yeah. And that's why I've gone for Hanya at two behind Gohar, because I think that overall level of consistency from Gohar is what might separate them. Yeah. No, I, I'm i actually starting to agree with the list you've crafted up because, I mean, we're not talking about who the best squash player at their day is. It's really also about consistency of uh, showing up to every tournament and being able to sustain the level. But I guess we're moving on to... I have no clearly have no idea who the number one is with this list, but so who do you have? So surprisingly, I've gone for Nada Abbas. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Nuran Gohar. Um, again, just because of her... Well, two reasons, actually. One I've mentioned is the consistency, but also just her her drive and determination. I think the the consistency is what separates her from Hanya and the drive and determination is what separates her for, from Shabini. Um, again, if you look at her stats from last season, she played 14 events, made 12 finals. God. Like she won seven. Yeah. So she, she won half the events that she played, which Shabini also won half the events that she played, but she only won five of 10 as opposed to seven of 14. Um, My goodness, one amazing, yeah. I don't know if you saw this, but one amazing stat that came out quite recently was that she was the highest earner on the PSA Tour last season, men or women. Where did you find this? Um, Gem of an article. Came out in an article by PSA, I believe. But uh, Who would have thought that they'd be revealing? Yeah. Um, wow. Because they revealed the total prize money for all, I think it was over $8 million. I think, um, I think Gohar came out ahead of Ali Farag something like $285,000 was her prize money for the year. Wow. Um, and I think Ali was 275, so she was marginally ahead of him. Um, and then the, there was another interesting bit of information about the average prize money of uh, the t- across the top 10. There's something like 120, some t- 125, 127,000 from memory. Mm-hmm. Um, which... Yeah, it's, I mean, there's two ways you can look at that. One is that if you want to compare it to other sports, it's maybe not great. But I still think um, for where squash is, that they're pretty good numbers. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I think I think the biggest concern is, I mean, I, I feel that they do justice for the top 10, but I think the drastic prize money decrease as the rankings get lower is yeah. where it makes it life so tough as a squash player. But going back to Gohar, what about her game impresses you the most? I think she's just so relentless. Um, she's got that Gaultier uh, yeah. ask about her. She's just taking people off the court. And again, when I was looking through her results, like the number of times she beats pretty good players, like she played, um, I'll just look it up, but. She played someone at the World Tour final. I think it might have been Gina Kennedy. Um, 19 minutes. She, yeah, just destroyed. Like, Joel King, many, 20 minutes. Amanda Sobey, 19 minutes. That's that's bonkers. Yeah. I yeah. Think, it's obviously the best of three, so it's a little bit artificial. Mm-hmm. But, um, I mean, Gina, she beat three and four in 19 minutes. 11-3, 11-4. Amanda Sobey, she beat 11-4, 11-5. Joel King, she beat 11-6, 11-1. Um, so like there's six games against three legitimate top eight players and the closest game she's had is 11-6 wow um, yeah I'm yeah, yeah. looking at a few others like Sarah Jane Perry Elguna she beat 11-4 11-5 11-5 32 minutes 
Um, Rowan El Arabi, 11-1, 11-5, 11-4. So, so they're the sort of things that have impressed me the most. Um, final the TOC, she played Amanda. She beat her 11-7, 11-7, 11-3. So girls are, girls are struggling to even get close to her. Yeah. Where she's a little bit fragile is that if the match does get close, then it it's, it seems like she's vulnerable at that point. If mm-hmm. you can sort of crack through to making it a close game or a close match, then she sort of, it's almost like she questions her tactics and she's not sure whether to keep just pounding the ball or to attack more or mix up the pace. Um, That's a great one- point you bring up that I, I do think – with this season, having the coaches back could solve that problem. Yeah, potentially. And we we'll just further add on to your argument about why she should be world number one by the end of the season. But I know we finished the list, but I can't, I must ask before we end it. Um, what are your thoughts on this Hania and Gohar <laughs> um, war that's been happening? Do you think it's going to become, I mean, it's already problematic, but what do you think is going to happen this season? I mean, the first thing I would say is I would love to know the full origin of it Um, because (laughs) everyone obviously talks about that match they played where there was the issues with the clearing and the um, the sort of wide cross courts and and the way that was handled by the referee with the original sort of like um, no let and then she played the ball and drilled her um, and then she comes back on, gets warned and then comes back on and gets another no let like that to me was just poor refereeing, which mm-hmm. contributed to it. Um, the only thing I I didn't like the way Gohar just hit her and then walked off court. Yeah, um, I'm not I'm not a fan of that. I don't think Hanya's particularly bad at like crowding opponents. I know some people can do that, like they, they almost try and force you to play straight, but I don't sense that Hanya was doing that. I think. I think Gohar knew exactly what she was doing. I think I hesitate to say it was intentional, but I, I certainly know that she didn't really care if it hit her or not. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying she deliberately tried to hit her, but it was certainly like this might hit her, and if it does, tough shit. Yeah, uh, and I'm not a huge fan of that. If I'm honest. Um, I think it's disrespectful to your opponent, and um, I mean it, it has the potential to end you. Like you would never walk up and punch your opponent to try and injure them. So so why are you allowed to get away with that? Yeah, get awarded at the point for yeah. <laughs> for drilling. Um well all I know is if they ever um be in the final, whether it be the TOC or US Open, I, I do not care. I'm gonna go watch that match in person. <laughs> I need to get that front row seating. Um but yeah, yeah. I <laughs> I would love to also know the origin story behind where this all stemmed about. But they actively do not like each other. And I mean, there's your next task in your your next episode. <laughs> get either one of them on, and then get them to dish the truth. I've been I've been asking Hania to come on for a while. She hasn't responded to me, but and that's why you get stuck with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, oops, but um, yeah, I think I think that's a solid list. Um, I really hope this causes a ruckus, Stuart. I really do. I really hope that people get pissed off. Um, I think it's a fantastic list. And would not be lying if my intention was to get people pissed off. But, yeah, I'm going to wrap up this episode for the Power Rankings. Thank you, Stuart, for doing it um, and being being the, the person who might get targeted after this is released. But appreciate I mean, it. Fortunately, I'm not on Instagram, so they can't target me there. And my Twitter account is private, so I don't think anyone on this list follows me on Twitter either. Well, there you have it. Thank you, Stuart.